May the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever had an experience of something so perfect you didn't want it to change? I was thinking about this. I was thinking about perfection and change and our fear of change as I was watching the new Barbie movie. Now, bear with me here. At the beginning of the movie, everything is perfect in Barbie land. A perfect and pink Garden of Eden, if you will. All the Barbies and Kens in their respective places doing their Barbie and Ken things. But our Barbie heroine senses change afoot. And without giving too much of the movie away, there's this physical and spiritual stirring up within her that causes her to reevaluate everything, to seek knowledge and experiences in the new world, and to confront the difficult but sometimes necessary need for change. And the same is true for Ken, too. And initially, it's not something she wants to do, not at all. She likes things just the way they are in Barbie land, and that's where she wants to stay. And let me add that while the word patriarchy is used quite a bit uh, in the movie, I didn't find it particularly anti-male or anti-men. Instead, I found myself wondering about the deep issues that lie under this haze of Barbie pink, uh, laugh out loud moments, and awesome dance numbers. It's just like how we grow as humans, beloved children of God. How we look at issues like power and purpose within and despite our gender and roles and stereotypes. How we acknowledge the finitude of our lives and how we move towards whole personhood in the midst of all of this and our gifts and our imperfections. And importantly, how we embrace change, when our inclination might be to stay put just as we are in whatever version of Barbie land we find ourselves in. Like Barbie, life outside the box can be messy and scary and leave us tattered around the edges. I think our disciples, Peter especially in our morning gospel, want to stay with Jesus in the perfect mountaintop experience that is the transfiguration. To put it in a box, literally, three boxes really, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For Peter and the disciples, Jesus' transformation reveals his heavenly glory, who Jesus is, the divine Son of God. Jesus' face changes, his robes are dazzling, and they reflect God's glory. Moses and Elijah appear before them to talk to Jesus and then a cloud covers them and this voice proclaims, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. They are wrapped up in Jesus' glory and light, the weight of the cloud upon them, this heavenly instruction. It's beautiful and terrifying and absolutely awe-inspiring. And can't we identify with Peter who so desperately wants to capture this moment? Beyond a mountaintop selfie, we can imagine him saying, stop, don't move, freeze. This is it. Everything is crazy and beautiful, and somehow it all makes sense. Who you are, who we are, let's just keep things exactly as they are. It's like those moments we have and that we long to hold on to, right? Times of closeness to God or someone we love or, or sometimes just that fleeting moment that right now, Right in this moment, all is well in the world. It can be so ephemeral. And sadly, like the disciples, we can't stay on the mountaintop forever. Everyday life with its ups and downs and all of its change awaits us. And it can be frightening to head down the mountain, right? For Jesus and the disciples, their return to the valley is met by a demon-possessed boy his father, and a crowd desperate for a cure. Followed by Jesus' second prediction of his own suffering and death, and then arguments among the disciples about who's the greatest. It makes that mountaintop experience seem all the more appealing. But it is Jesus who leads them down the mountain. And it's their job to figure out how to hold on to Jesus' light and glory, to make sense of it, in their return to the real world, 
and in all that will follow. Jesus' suffering, his death, his crucifixion, and his resurrection, all of this in this valley of ordinary and extraordinary life, and where they are called to bear the light and love of Christ in our hurting world. It's hard to let go of what we've had, what we've known and experienced, isn't it? But the truth is time pushes us forward and we're forced to see, we get to see, but maybe sometimes we're forced to see what God has in store for us next. How what has been might even inform and become part of the next part of our journey. If we stay frozen in one spot, we might miss God doing a new thing in our midst. But how? How do we embrace the challenge, the change that comes with stepping out of our version of Barbie land, away from what we perceive to be perfect or safe or at least something well known? A couple of thoughts come to mind. The first is the importance of friends, soul friends. Anamkara, the Celtic Christians called them, trusted companions who come alongside us in our Christian journey. I've seen you form these friendships here at St. Peter's in the Woods, relationships that support one another, promote deep connection and healing, wholeness, holiness, spiritual formation, and sometimes just a lot of fun. I think we embrace change and challenge by trusting that Jesus goes ahead of us down the mountain. Jesus compels us down the mountain and gives us everything we need. Now, we might say, who am I to change, to take this on, to risk what is comfortable for what is unknown or scary? Can we trust that God is with us, transfiguring our fears and imperfections, reminding us of that divine love and light and glory that reside within you and within me, that are at work, within you and within me, not only for our own sanctification, but for the building up of God's kingdom. I want to leave us with a reflection this morning. You might have heard it before. You may need to hear it again. I think it might help us come full circle with Barbie and the disciples coming down the mountain and our own journeys into the unknown. It goes like this. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. May it be so. Amen.